All right, hey guys, uh, my name is Jake Long. I'm working on developing communication tools for New York City's urban hydromet test bed. It's a rare weather station around New York City uh, that I'll get into. Um, Co authors of Dimitri uh, Ambrose uh, with Angela um, Candace, um, and then we're doing my advisor, Dr. Craig Rolando Fireser. And yeah, let's get into it. Is there anything on? We can look at it. Yeah, we can look at it. Yeah, we need it on for recording. <laughs> I, um, I saw a few people, other people do this, so I thought I could put a short bio. Um, but I'm not working on the urban hydromet test bed. I do some developing of GIS software um, in uh, something called the Unreal Engine. I work on the springs, do freshwater spring cars research, and then now I'm, I'm more focused on the urban hydromet test bed and developing those projects. So, what is the New York urban hydromet test bed? We call it the New York City UHMT. Um, it's an array of 19 weather stations around the city. Maybe more to come in the future. We're working on that now. Um, but as you can see, they're spread throughout those who are not accustomed to New York City uh, throughout Man Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, uh, Bronx, Staten Island is very obviously empty. Um, we're working to fill that in the future. Um, city Palace, where we're based, is way up here. So this is, this is quite, quite a travel distance that we're working on, on expanding the network. Um, and then you can see just a general station density here in blue. We are collecting things such as temperature, um, precipitation, humidity, soil moisture, and uh, through these um, array of weather stations. Here we see a few examples at, at various locations spread throughout the city. These are located anywhere from schools to housing um, to other, other sorts of public and private spaces. Um, I'll get into a few of the more specific locations later, but we can see here, generally, we have our weather station, so from tripod, powered by battery and solar panels. We have things like precipitation gauges, um, humidity sensors, and our, um, our temperature sensors here. It will allow these to connect to the network and talk to our servers. So um, I'm working on a few things, but first of all, we need to get these things up and running again. With the uh, you know, with COVID shutdown and, um, and a few other things, these weather stations have gone offline. Uh, the, they were originally connected via the 3G network uh, by, by my advisor up here a few years ago. And we're switching that to the 4 network now, now that the is gone offline. Um, so I'm installing, so I, I the general workflow here, I need to first install uh, new modems um, provided by Campbell. We have to update the SIM cards, provided uh, uh, some static IP addresses, get those connected to the server, um, do some rewiring here, then connect and install these new uh, 4G telemetry units and set them to the northeast um, part of the Verizon network. Okay, that is so. Um, these weather stations are kind of out in elements all the time. They're, they're very good with standing elements, but they also have to withstand New Yorkers. And so we have to rewire some, some, uh, some of the units, uh, kind of ensure a, a, and um, to make QC the connectivity and make sure everything's working and robust. Uh, we have to rebury some storm moisture probes that are sometimes pulled out, check again, make sure they're connected. Um, and then we, we connect the computer, make sure everything's uh, talking to the network correctly. Um, Okay, make sure everything's connected and it work correctly. Um, make sure all of our settings are good and, and uh, reconnect everything um, uh, to the 4, 4G network. Yeah. Okay, so after all that's been updated, we traveled to the weather stations, we updated this equipment. Um, we are left with a, with a fully functional and working and, uh, and clean. Uh, weather station. I say clean because they're not always clean. Again, this is exposed to the elements, exposed to people, and sometimes um, you know things happen. So you go we, after after everything's been installed, the solar panels are cleaned off, the weather stations are scooped out. You know any sort of like uh, the trouble, any sort of like grid that's gotten in there has to be cleaned out. Um, replace locks if we need to. Put our signage on there to explain to the public if they do come across what's happening um, here, and it's, it's not alien equipment. Which get some get some weird ideas going around, um, and uh, and we're we're doing good science here. To, you know, let's leave it alone. From here, after we've connected to the to the network, it can uh, the weather stations talk to the network. The weather uh, the network then talks to our servers, and we are left with data files that are sent to our PD uh, that are sent to the CRAS data server as we have a person. Um, we're working on renaming some file names, but generally these files are sent. In these uh, text limited and these uh, common delimited files with their various parameters. We're collecting a 15 minute resolution. 
And as you can see, they are, we are currently putting them into these data folders that are made available to the public. And I'll get a little bit in, uh, further into that later, but for now, we have a public server that the public can access um, these, these data sets and work with them if they want to. Okay, so in order to make these files, um, we first need to, I should say, um, after we have these files, we want to make a grid product. You can see these web stations are, are, are kind of spread throughout the city on an irregular grid. And it would really be helpful if we could regularize that grid if we could turn these into some sort of raster product, which we can then combine with other data sets to, to create a, a more holistic and uh, more uh, higher, higher temporal and higher spatial product to uh, provide to the public and, and private sectors. Um, and I also kind of see between the weather stations. So, so we take these 19 weather stations. Um, the, I'm, I'm using a spline interpolation with tension. You kind of think of that as a, an interpolation method where each weather station has, where each weather station has an x, y value and the z value is like the height. And if you stretch a, if you stretch a net over top of that and you pull it tight, you kind of get a spline interpolation where the interpolated values are the shape of that net that's been stretched. And it provides a really good way to model um, uh, the values in which you, you don't want to overshoot or undershoot your, your ground truth down because then that goes exactly through those points and provides good interpolation between it. In doing so, we're also upset, we're also sampling. Uh, we have to create we have to create a raster grid of a certain resolution to match with other products that we're going to be um, combining them with later. And I'm just showing temperature here uh, in, in converted from Fahrenheit. Um, Celsius would be just as easy, but here I'm trying to Fahrenheit for just temperature. We can we can just follow variables. Um, but I'm just focusing on temperature similar to that. Okay, so what are we combining this with? After we have the interpolated product from the hydrogen stations, um, we are then pulling in the HRR product, the NOAA uh, high resolution rapid group pressure product. It's a modeled product that has this is augmented by 15 minute radar data. So it's a one hour temporal resolution map. We have a three hour spatial, we have a three longer spatial resolution of this map. It's, it has a different projection, um, but this is a very good product, except in very complex terrains. We've heard early on in the conference where models don't always work in complex terrains because uh, um, you know, it, it, they provide oftentimes uh, less than ideal uh, uh, values. And a city such as New York City, where any city is really a very complex term. Um, you have weird uh, fluid dynamic effects going on, you have weird temperature fluctuations. And so we would like to provide a high resolution um, maps of these products and set with the temperature and precipitation and possibly some others after, after we get them some. Um, but to combine this with the other products that has been interpolated, we need to first, uh, it, it helps to get it to the same resolution and the same projection. Um, and the same, same coordinates and so on. And so we have here um, an example of what one of those HR products looks like after we upsample it to the same resolution of the interpolated map was sampled earlier. Um, using nearest neighbor to upsample, keeping simple. Um, here we have the temperature standardized, um, in this case, the Fahrenheit. And we are taking this upsample product and we're then stacking it with, um, uh, we're then stacking it with the, the other product um, from the hydromet. Um, and we are combining them right now using weight some um, combination. And you can see here, again, the same, same resolution. Uh, I haven't reprojected the underlying map, but, but that's important to do as well um, in this graphic. And after we do that, after things are standardized, the same coordinate system, same projection, same resolution, we're then left with this way that some uh, uh, reprojected crop uh, assimilation product. It is now at 15 minute resolution and is, is a much more spatially accurate to a very complex terrain of the city. Of course, these products we are hoping to make available to the public as I'll as talk about in a little bit. But here we can see just a clean product, crop to New York City shape file with land sat instead of the very base map. Makes a little, a little more accessible to the public so I can understand what they're looking at. And, um, Okay, so so why what's the point of all this? As you can missing bottom here. But the, we start with the no HRR product, it's a one hour, three kilometer, 
uh, map, and we are using our merge hydromet assimilation maps. Um, we, we are transitioning towards that for the complex terrain of the city because we now have a much more uh, you know, spatially dense map, but also the, the temporal density is up four, four times more. So we're going from one hour to 15 minutes. We're all, but, but I think the, the cool thing here is we're also controlling the rate at which the, the, the polling rate for, for this data, um, the rate at which the, the data is collected and sets the search and these products are created. So if we wanted to, we could go from our 15 minute map, which is already much more dense than the existing, and we go to like a five minute map, which is even, you know, three times denser than that for, for really any of those issues. And we really see this as a very valuable product um, to a few different, not only to the public, but, but uh, to a few different industries and the government as well. And so, providing this out to the public, we have a we have sort of a mock up sample um, website that, that we aim to produce here. Again, uh, we just have uh, our, 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 our HydroMet clean assimilation based map here, um, where the user will be able to select a station. We can see um, we're, we're, we're viewing, say, like three days here. So, we have a, we're, and we're viewing temperature. So, we have three days of temperature at a specific location. Um, we have a picture of, of the web station and the, the public will be able to, instead of going to this text file just earlier, they'll be able to download exactly the things that they want, just like a weather.com or like a weather underground type of, of display. Um, so we're, we're mimicking what has already exists because we think it works really well. Okay, so what is, again, um, kind of what is, what is the point? What, why, why? More data is good, yes, but, but also um, for flood damage, flood damage, flood forecasting. One of the other colleagues in our group, uh, Candace is working on, um, uh, is doing great thesis on this. So, so these products are really being used as different than the summer project. We think that um, Con Edison, the electricity and gas provider for New York City has expressed interest in, um, uh, it has expressed interest in a higher resolution temperature map for the city. Uh, so they can more accurately uh, balance the grid and, and, and um, allocate electricity to various parts of the city. It's really bad to overproduce energy and blackouts occur in old groups. So it's very important that they get a very good handle on exactly where it's in the power of went. And we think this product will really help them. And of course, um, health risks, accurate flood warning systems, um, accurate warning systems for both heat and temperature, temperature and precipitation, rather. Um, and these products will, will, will certainly help us and benefit the citizens of New York City. And after we have this built for New York City, we can understand further. All right. And then finally, um, public outreach is a huge, um, is a huge second point for us. It's not only what got me into science in the first place. Um, when I was younger, having scientists come in and talk and give me science lectures, who really got me hooked. So you'd be able to give that back and, and have these web stations set up at various, um, often under privileged locations in the city is very important to us. We have them set up at various high schools and, and middle schools throughout the city. Um, Here's just a few weeks ago where we where we uh, was in James Madison High School. We can see a few uh, few past students of the center and of City College. Um, we're now teachers at this college, at, at this school, and we are we are um, going to be setting a weather station here in the near future. And then we, we are going into the schools and talking to the students. Um, you know, get get the science in their face. Make, uh, you know, make it make it a real tangible thing. Lower the barrier to entry. Make it not scary. And make it really interesting. And hopefully get them involved. And turn their students into colleagues um, at the at the center, who then become teachers and the same students who are teaching and kind of with that circle. Um, you know, give, give back and it's really important for us. And then I would really like to thank everyone here. Um, you know, no ancestors, uh, City College of New York, uh, for allowing us to have them and to let me play with cool folks. Thank you.